It's gorgeous like Georgia's. Ew. If, oh my God. I'm feeling like, if you can't tell, I'm pouring more cold brew and I'm already feeling like, <gasps> you know the vibe? Um, anyways, I'm drinking Chamberlain coffee today. By the way, hi, this is Jalen. Welcome back to my channel. Um, I'm doing an April wrap up with 11 books that I read this month, which, how? I don't get it. They're all kind of small, that's why, that's how I did it. But yeah, I'm drinking Chamberlain coffee. I actually, so, <laughs> I just discovered Miss Emma Chamberlain. Like, I didn't know who she was. Like, I had heard the name around, but like, I was never a person that watched like vloggers like that, like in that YouTube era. I'm still, she's still like in her era, but um, I'm kind of obsessed with her. Sorry about it, sorry I'm late to the party, but yeah, she got me, I bought her coffee and it's good. I really like it actually, so. You go, girl. Okay, anyways. Hello, April wrap up, 11 books. Can we talk about it? I like when I break 10, like it just feels nice. Yeah, the tea this month has been using audiobooks while I'm reading at the same time. And then like when you're going to do like chores and stuff, depending on the book, like if you want to, you can still like keep listening to the book while you're doing other things. That's the tea to reading more books, I think, is multitasking. I'm feeling chaotic at the gig. I'm feeling chaotic at the gig. Oh my god. First book, Acts of Service by Lillian Fishman. Announcement coming your way. This is my May book club pick. At the end of this month, I think it's May 26th to Thursday. I could be wrong. I will be joined by the lovely, the one and only CJ from CJ Reads to talk about this very steamy, queer, wild, philosophical, sort of big brained novel. This is the best book that I've read this month. One of my favorites of the year. I am so excited that we're reading this book. I think there's so much to unpack about this dynamic in this book. So we essentially follow this queer woman who, I think she's 27, she's living in New York, and she ends up cheating on her girlfriend. And she becomes involved, well, so she posts pictures of herself online, and then a woman responds to it and like wants to meet up with her. And then it's revealed that, that woman has a boyfriend or a partner and asks her, her name's Eve, to be a part of their like, dynamic so to become like a thruple in a sense but it's not really like a committed situation she just kind of like hangs out with them has sex what have you but what this book gradually does is it reveals itself to be this reflection on the morality of sex and desire and how those things form who we are as individuals and when the things that we want don't really comport with societal expectations how that kind of plays out in a dynamic such as this when it seems that the man in the situation, quite toxic. Or is this really something that's actually benefiting Eve and Olivia? Um, or is this something that should be challenged? And if the women in the situation are finding joy from it, or so they're saying that they're finding joy from it, who should question them about that? Or should we not? And how is this idea of being seen by another person or another couple being the kind of foundation for someone's self-identity. Eve, she ends up feeling that she's being actually seen for the first time in this dynamic and what that means for her. And so this book is a sticky morality novel, sort of like a dark comedy of manners about this dynamic. And I just ate it the hell up. So good. Um, I actually picked this one up because Sheila Hetty has a blurb for it and Raven Leilani. Um, but in Sheila Hetty's blurb, she says, it is a book of exciting, provocative complexity, and for me, it made the human creature feel like something new. And I'm like, girl, don't play with me. I, Sheila Hetty, as you might know, she's one of my favorite writers right now. So I agree, this book really explores the weirdness of sex and being a human and sex. <laughs> my ideas are wild today, I'm sorry everyone. Okay, so yeah, pick this up, it's out now. Um, I bought myself this nice new edition. I had a, like a bound galley of it. And I was like, you know what? This is a favorite. I need this hot pink on my shelves. So yeah, May 26, discussing it with CJ. And I think this is a secret. Well, it's not a secret. I just, it's not confirmed yet, but I think I'm interviewing Lillian Fishman next week. So fingers crossed. So that'll be coming out first and then a discussion. So more content on this book is coming, but yeah, I'm excited. So we will see. Okay, next up, I read Checkout 19 by Claire Louise Bennett. This is a book that is kind of one of the more singular and original takes on autofiction that I've read in a while. Um, I think it's kind of like this response to the state of like the current 
auto-fictional, typical thing that we're seeing in contemporary literature, but essentially this follows an unnamed narrator who is becoming a writer, and this book is all about kind of her reflection on growing up with books and how they formed her identity, and so this book is all about the love and joy of reading and how it impacts someone in their development. So I think if you are like me, anyone that loves books about books, definitely take a chance on this one, but I will say like my one critique or one thing that I didn't love about this book as much is that it's told in this sort of like stream of consciousness style in which the narrator is trying to pin down her thoughts on like what she's thinking about different things. So like it's constantly like she's writing and seeking assurance in what she's saying about the topic of reading. So like, I think I've given an example on this channel before when I talked about this book before, but okay, here's an example. So it says, there's a fine art to being idle in fact. That's right, there is an art to it and very few people are naturally in possession of the gumption and fortitude necessary to pull it off. Reading outside on a summer's afternoon, when there have been weeks and weeks of hot sunny days, one after the next. There really is nothing else quite like it. We liked nothing better. So the first story in here is told in this collective we, all about like why we tend to read the bottom of the right side of a book faster than the top of the left. I love stuff like that, the examinations of our habits as readers and what books mean to us, even just as objects, having them next to us. But um, aside from like that first story, I think that's like the standout here. Some of the stories here in terms of the creation of certain texts that the writer goes through, I found to be a little bit dense and not circular, but just kind of hard to get in the swing of, or just kind of didn't really like stick in my mind too much when I was reading it. It was kind of like, by the end of it, I was kind of ready to be done, just given that kind of repetitive, seeking for assurance narration style on this. I hope that makes sense, but um, I do think it's rewarding and worthwhile read if you like books about books. Next, Very Cold People by Sarah Manguso. Uh, this one is very, very, very much in conversation with or similar to Childhood by Tova Ditlevson, which is the first book in the Copenhagen trilogy, which I also loved, but it's very similar to the first one, Childhood, in which this book, the narrator, it's told in fragments, but she's reflecting on the very cold people that she grew up with in this fictional town in, I believe, Massachusetts. And so, what this book eventually reveals itself to be is this meditation on trauma and the ways that children process trauma going into adulthood and the sort of gaps and interesting ways of thinking that trauma can be explored in a childhood setting and how you don't really have the full tools to understand what's going on around you. But us as readers, there's like a sense of dramatic irony of like understanding what's truly going on in this book. So it's very fucking dark, but I did like it. It's very like clean, simple, precise prose that we're getting a lot, I think, in contemporary literature, and I really liked the reading experience of it, but just trigger warnings going into it, of course. It's very dark, it's a quick little read too, and it's good on audio. I did both together, as is the norm. Um, next up, An Exciting and Inner, what? An Exciting and Vivid Inner Life by Paula Della Rosa. This is a book that I can't stop talking about, it seems like, on all of my, in my videos, my platforms, whatever, um, but this is essentially a damn near perfect short story collection that I am so excited to read more of his work going forward. Um, this one publishes in the UK on June 2nd, so definitely check it out. You can order it from Blackwell's if you live in the US. Um, I'm pre-ordering a copy for myself because I have just this galley, but I wanna support, support the dolls. But this one is essentially, to put it simply, a bunch of queer short stories about young queer people navigating late capitalism, essentially. Um, being poor, trying to find love, being depressed, and looking at some generally unlikable characters, very similar to Otessa Moshtag, I would say, in terms of the type of characters that we see in here. But I think he has a very unique and distinct writing style that I love to read. There's this very like dry, dark, and, and slightly humorous tone in all these stories that I really enjoyed. And just kind of knowing him and his tastes outside of this collection, it's really fun to see how he puts pen to page and how he crafts short stories himself. And I just think he's a incredible writer. I love this so much. I feel like I've raved about it enough, but just like, please read it. Best short story collection I've read so far this year. Like it's it's giving everything that I need from short, short stories. Like it's excellent. Um, next up, I read Body Work by Melissa Fibos. This is a book of nonfiction all about, as the subtitle says, the radical power of personal narrative. So this is told in four essays all about the craft of writing memoir and what it's done for Melissa Fibos personally in her processing her own trauma. And so the first essay I really loved, it was called In Praise of Navel Gazing. And it's all about this stigma that's behind navel gazing in writing and how it's often critiqued in writing of like, oh, your memoir is too navel gazy. But Melissa says like, 
that's the point of memoir is to stare right into your navel, I guess, um, and really consider your own personal experiences and how putting them on the page can help you process and understand what has happened to you or what you've done in the past and how that can be informative for readers if you are so inclined to have your work put out there. But she also says just writing a memoir personally is beneficial for her own growth and understanding herself and, and all of that. So aside from that essay, there's also one about um, the art of writing sex well. There's one about writing about other people in your uh, personal narrative. And I thought that was fun thinking about the recent discourses in certain fiction and nonfiction, writing about other people and the morality and ethics of that. And then she gives some tips on how to do that. And the last one is about um, confession in writing. So very good all around. I really liked it. Also did it on audio. She has a great like narrating voice. Next up, I have Leaving the Atocha Station by Ben Lerner. This was super fun for me to read because as you may know, my favorite book of last year was Fake Accounts by Lauren Euler. And in that book, she mentions Leaving the Atocha Station for like one of the side characters mentions that she likes it. And the narrator's like, oh, I'm surprised that she liked it being kind of like snarky, you know? Um, but this is one that I know that Lauren Euler likes. And so I have the Topeka School, but I saw this at a used bookstore and I was like, you know what? This is the first one I think that he wrote. And so I wanted to try this first and it's slim and I loved it. I've realized that like depressed expat fiction is like my jam, I love it. Um, but this one essentially follows uh, an unnamed, or no, he's named a narrator named Adam, I believe. Yeah, Adam Gordon. He's an expat in Spain and he's trying to become a better poet, essentially. And this book really considers thematically this idea of what it means to have a profound experience of art, whether art can really instill a sense of profundity in someone and like really move someone and what is the purpose of art if it doesn't do that sort of thing and how does one get to a place of skill and intellect and wisdom to be able to replicate something profound within art. And he's thinking about this in the guise of him writing poetry and trying to write a good poem essentially. And I know Ben Lerner himself is a poet and he wrote a book that I read last year, I believe called The Hatred of Poetry. And so it was fun like seeing the influence on Lauren Euler's book and then also thinking about his own essay on The Hatred of Poetry in this fictional account of a guy who's depressed, has some poor habits, navigating love and just depressed dude thinking about stuff. Love that. <laughs> so yeah, it was really good. I feel like I didn't really give an intellectual response to this book right now, but um, just know that it slapped and I really enjoyed my time with it. Next up, The Pisces by Melissa Broder. I fucking love Melissa Broder. I'm obsessed. Like Stan, like Stan the House on Boots. Like I'm so, I love. She has a podcast called So Sad Today. She also runs the Twitter account called So Sad Today. And she really taps into like depressed woman moving through the world fiction, but she also does it like in her tweets, in her podcast, and when she just eats something in her car and talks about her navigating depression and things that have happened to her since then, and thinking about very existential things. Um, and this book has a lot of that in it, but this one also is this sort of literary erotica merman situation that I think is really, while on the surface level, it was entertaining to read, and I was like, what the hell am I reading? It's also quite well done and smart on this topic of someone with an addictive personality trying to fill the hole within themselves with love and other people, namely here, a merman. So it was just a fun kind of magical realist read that doesn't answer everything for you by the end. And I thought it was so smart how it did that. I love this. She can do no wrong, in my opinion. I've loved this. I've loved Milk Fed. I loved her essay collection, So Sad Today. I love her podcast. I love her Twitter. She's just incredible. Favorite writer for sure. One of my favorite writers. While I was reading The Pisces, I ended up discovering that The Hour of the Star by Clarice Lispector was narrated the audiobook by Melissa Broder. So I was like, all right, let's go. Picked it up. And this book I think is my least favorite of the month, but it's not that it's bad. It was just quite challenging and I wasn't sure how to think about it given its weird writing style. And from some pieces that I've read about her work, I think this is kind of a staple of Clarice Suspector is this kind of like abstractly philosophical like musings in her work that is kind of hard to, not hard to get into, but it's just a little bit challenging for readers, I think. I think it was actually in one of the essays in this uh, special edition of the book talking about 
translating her work and the style that she uses in her books. Anyways, this essentially looks at a writer writing about a woman named Maccabea who is an impoverished young woman living in Brazil and how he's struggling to get her on the page and his own struggles as a writer. So this book is doing like two things. It's looking at the struggles of a writer and also looking at this woman named Maccabea in this idea that she is so like rooted in her poverty and her not knowing anything else that she kind of finds solace or doesn't know anything different. So she just kind of feels happy despite her poor living conditions. And aside from all that, this is also metafictional because Clarissa Spector is writing a writer who's a man writing a woman and what happens to her and the questions that that all proposes. I still don't know what I think about this book. It's very odd and surprising. I will say it was really hard for me to get into it because I feel like oftentimes the ideas and structure and narrative of this didn't really congeal for me. It kind of felt all over the place in terms of random musings or moving the plot along and then jumping back into the writer's thoughts about things and then just like random asides. It just didn't really, it was hard for me to get into. And I feel like if I reread this another time, I might get more out of it or I just approached it in the wrong way, potentially. I don't know. I'm mixed on it, but if you've read this, please let me know and talk with me about it because I would love to chat what she's doing here. Next up, I read The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde, and this book was wild, I will say. This is a book, I was looking up top 10 lists of like favorite writers, so I looked up Sheila Hetty, her top 10 favorite books, and this was number one on the list. And I had read this book back in freshman year of high school, and on Goodreads, I gave it five stars, and I remember loving it. I remember really digging the dark, I was like a horror lad growing up. I loved horror. And so it was like the first time I read a classic back then that felt kind of like horror adjacent. And I just loved it, especially with like the queer undertones that I knew about and learned about in class. So I picked it up again and I reread it. And y'all, this book slaps so hard. It is so good. It is so, so good. It is so, it, I didn't remember it being as dark as it is. Like when something happens, if you've read this, you know, like the main climax of the book, I just, yeah, it's wild. I didn't remember that happening for some reason. And just this idea of selling yourself for beauty and what it does to a corrupt soul and seeing a corrupt soul on a painting deteriorating. Okay, sorry, I was interrupted. I don't know what I was saying about this, but I don't really have anything else to say other than this idea of art and beauty playing together, I think is really fun in this book. The content of this book is just so, so surprising for me for a classic, it's like quite, bleak. Yeah, I don't know. I really like this book. I don't really have too much to say about it other than it was a fun reading experience. I was surprised by how dark it was. I think Oscar Wilde's an excellent writer, clearly. Um, but yeah, also I listened to this one with the Russell Tobey Audible narration, which I know we hate, but um, I've been trying to use up like the rest of my Audible credits and I saw that that was included with Audible. So I listened to it and it's truly one of the best audiobooks that I've ever listened to like in my life. And I think I'm going to make an audiobook recommendation video and that will be near the tip top of the list from what I've listened to so far. So lovely, lovely stuff. Next up I have Claudia Note. What? Next up I have Ellen and Nose by Claudia Pinheiro, translated by Francis Riddle. This book was my book club pick for last month. It was the first selection for my book club and um, I'll link it below if you haven't seen it already. But and just FYI, in that live stream, my guest Kieran at Katie Books, he had to dip out a little bit early. So it ended up being kind of like a live stream, but it was fun. I really liked it. So if you would like me to do live streams going forward, I actually really enjoy just like shooting the shit and talking to people in the comments and sharing things. And it was fun. But anyway, so this book, Ellen Knows, it follows this older woman who has Parkinson's disease and her daughter has recently allegedly committed suicide. And Ellen knows that her daughter couldn't have done that. Um, based on what she knows about her daughter. And so this book is told, it kind of go, jumps back and forth in time from the present in which Elena, she is boarding a bunch of different trains to get to this destination to go to this woman's house who she thinks will help her figure out what happened to her daughter, Rita. And then the other half of the book is mostly flashback, learning about the fraught mother-daughter dynamic between Elena and Rita and how those two things play together by the end of it. And so this one is in a sense like a literary crime novel, but this book is really well done in its explorations on the page of Parkinson's disease and how it contributes this sense of claustrophobia and its telling of 
what it feels like to have this disability for Elena, who is just trying to make it to a destination, but the various struggles that she has and the timing of certain pills that help her be able to move, how that all plays into her mind as she's trying to get to her destination, while also thinking about the impacts of her disease on her family, and the ideas of religion here and how that kind of plays into some of the mystery aspects of why her daughter was found hanging in a church and all these things like religion, family dynamics, disability, how all that, oh, and motherhood, how that all contributes to the reveal by the end of the book. This book broke my heart. It is so bleak, but it's so well done and well earned and just really, I think, kind of innovative. I've never really read a book that's like this, that plays with the form and explores so many different themes that come together in a really interesting way in terms of a crime context. Very good. And last but not least, I read The Very Last Interview by David Shields. This is a really weird and quite funny little book. It's essentially a collection of questions that David Shields has been asked in interviews, and he went back and compiled most of these questions, I think, and put them in a sort of narrative based on subject matter. So for example, there's school, reading, speech, he stutters, I guess, games, etc. So it's divided into subject and it follows just questions and no answers. So the questions sort of answer themselves based on what the next question is and the list of questions that he's receiving. And you kind of get a sense of what David is answering based on the questions that follow. And so the book is purely told in questions, but it becomes quite funny in that it seems to be auto-fictional and that David Shield seems to be playing with the questions that are being asked to sort of become this reflection of a writer questioning himself. To me, this book read as him trying to figure out what are people actually wanting to ask me and sometimes like with rude questions that he gets or very invasive questions or personal questions he's wondering or it makes the reader wonder whether the, he's actually being asked this or if it's more so David Shields musings on himself as a writer and what he's questioning himself in his place as a published writer with some fame and what that all means through this lens of like an interview. I think it's a really funny and interesting look at what it means to be an author with a public persona and being asked about your work while also thinking about yourself as a writer in response to the questions that are asked of you. It's smart, it's weird, it's not the most like, there's no narrative really, so it's more so just like this kind of experimental, thinky, funny, satirical, slim little book that I enjoyed. And that's about it. That is all I read in April, lots of slim stuff, but honestly, I liked everything that I read this month. It was overall really solid, and I can recommend all of these books, which is a success in my book. Let me know what the best book you read is this month, any disappointments. Chat with me in the comments. If you've read these, let me know what you think of them. And until next time, I will catch you all in the next one. Bye.